Welcome to the GCPO Landscape Conservation Cooperatives webinar presenting the results of a project entitled Current and Future Water Availability and Stream Flow Characteristics in the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks region. Today we will present the results of this project which models stream flow for all watersheds of the GCPO for a range of current and future climate and landscape scenarios. And now I have the honor of introducing Jacob LaFontaine, hydrologist with the USGS South Atlantic Water Science Center and the principal investigator on this project. Jacob has been with the USGS for 20 years with the first half of his career focused on the collection and interpretation of water resources data. Jacob has spent the last eight years focused on the development of hydrologic modeling methods and applications at the local, regional, and national scale. Before I hand it over to Jacob, I am going to launch a poll and ask you all to let us know a little bit more about yourselves. So just pick the category that seems to fit you the best, and I'll share the results in just a moment. I got 72% of the, oops, 76% of the votes in. I'm getting ready to close this poll. Okay, good. Most of you have voted. So you can see, oh, we have a, an interesting mix here, a little bit of everybody today. So that's a very good, diverse audience. So now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jacob. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, taking time to attend uh, this webinar today. Um, so as, as Greg had stated, uh, this is looking at uh, the work that we've done in the Gulf Coast Plains and Ozarks LCC region, as well as uh, some surrounding areas that we we're able to bring in as a part of this this effort and, and looking at providing water availability information and uh, statistics of flow uh, for various scenarios to, uh, to provide kind of a baseline information of which folks could then take these types of information and, and go forward to do uh, further activities. Uh, so I have a list of uh, co-investigators on this slide as well. So a lot of us that were had come together for this effort and a lot of uh, other in-kind uh, project work to, to get this completed. All right, so just to give you a brief outline, so we'll look at, you know, kind of what led to this project uh, from from the RFP that the GCPO had uh, had put out, uh, look at the various tools that we use to simulate uh, the hydrologic response of the region, uh, look at some results across the entire study area, and then also try and, and, and drill down and just look at perhaps uh, one smaller tributary basin to where that may be more applicable to what, what folks would want to manage, whether it's instead of the whole region, if, you know, what types of information be available at that scale. And that the final products that will become available, uh, the data sets as well as the documentation uh, as we wrap up this study. So looking at kind of what led into this effort, so uh, when the GCPO LCC folks had, had evaluated uh, to manage certain conditions or to get to certain conditions, they had these various categories and were able to you know, classify whether they, they had enough information in certain areas to move forward or whether there were areas that they needed uh, additional information. And so the, the darker, lower numbers indicated that they had a higher need for those types of inf information and so this box is around all the different types of, of flow characteristics and, and volumes uh, which, which fit well with our work here and that within this uh, project to, to really look across these different categories to make sure that the work that was performed you know that you know did it cover the entire uh, LCC did it you know at least cover that was it able to be uh, things that could integrate into other studies or ongoing activities, you know, was it forward-looking, were we not just trying to characterize the historical time period, but also look at providing some estimates of, of potential changes 
across the area. Uh, then focusing, you know, on information that decision makers or managers could could bring into their efforts. And you know, are were there opportunities that it would be uh, adaptive that you know you could incorporate other things beyond perhaps what this starts as as the baseline level information, and making sure that it you know we're providing information that's relevant to those that are on the ground and actually going to use this type of information. Uh, so this this table had come out of uh, the science agenda for the the GCPOLCC, and so the the effort that we have funded with the GCPO. Uh, through the RFP, also matched well with certain things that we were doing across the southeastern U.S. and even nationally, and so we were able to tie together with these other uh, funding sources, so uh, uh, the Southeast Climate Science Center, the South Central, EPA, uh, several programs in USGS, um, we're all able to, to really drive towards getting this, uh, this effort uh, to completion. So the objectives for for our project that we're talking about today, it's you know we we look to develop this multi-model synthesis for stream flow simulation, and so oftentimes you know everybody who, who tends to be a modeler may have their model of choice, um, and they may have different time steps, they may have different processes that they uh, simulate, and so being on several model intercomparison studies over the over the years, you know we we wanted to go that next step and say okay all of these different types of information are available and they all may have strengths or weaknesses and so is there a way that we can bring these together in a way that we end up with a better final product by, by combining these efforts. And, and so the other side of it is out of those model developments providing these flow characteristics, you know, the, the, the typical, uh, you know, looking at breaking up these hydrographs into various statistics that describe your know, magnitude of the flows, the timing of the flows, how, you know how long they last and the durations, rates of change, and and frequency, how often they occur, and so we looked to, to classify these for both a historical and uh, future period, and also incorporated some of the, uh, the climate change data sets as well as some land cover change parameterizations. So the study area is outlined in this bold blue line here, and so the the GCPO LCC is this lighter blue area. Um, and so, in looking at from a hydrologic perspective, you know we were cross-cutting several uh, of these basins in the southeastern U.S., especially you know the the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint, the Alabama, Tallapoosa, uh, Pusa, Tallapoosa, you know the Tennessee. And so uh, we got you know looked at some of those in-kind funding sources and were able to expand the study area to to complete those. Those basins, you know, as far east as the eastern, you know, eastern Georgia. So, so this stops at the the Savannah River Basin here is not included. And then on the north and west side, we had to make regional breakpoints on these large river basins. And so <clears throat> the the Red River, uh, the Mississippi River, we had to to pick a spot to stop to where we would have you know a, a regional inlet. Otherwise, if we'd done the whole Mississippi, we'd have been doing you know a third of the country. But the study area crosses, you know, a few different climate science center boundaries, which are in red, uh, several of the, the LCCs, uh, which are the, the colored polygons. Uh, so providing information that, you know, to all these different uh, groups. So looking just at, uh, you know, kind of describing the study area, so you look at the, uh, the topography of the study area, we see, uh, of course, in the coastal plain, relatively flat. Uh, up in the upper Tennessee River Basin, you know, we're in the lower Appalachian Mountains, and so those are the, the highest altitudes that we see in the study area, uh, and, you know, ranging from sea level to uh, over, almost over 1,600 meters in elevation. And then looking at uh, the general climatology, so long-term historical temperature and precipitation, so long-term temperature, no surprise, driven primarily uh, by latitude and elevation, so we see you know the, the coolest temperatures are in the lower Appalachians or in the northern part of the basin. Uh, precipitation accumulations tend to be drier, you know, along this northwestern edge. You know, as we start to move towards creeping into the to the Great Plains, uh, where we know that there's this this sharp 
threshold between the relatively wet southeast and then the arid uh, Midwest. And so how that plays in, whereas, you know, even in the lower Appalachians here, you know, there's some places that have almost 100 inches of, of rain uh, based on the climate data sets that we uh, use for this study. Looking at land cover across the study area, so these, uh, these purple lines represent the level two ecoregions. Uh, so they, they tend to generally line up with the physiographic provinces, um, but the, you know at least this is a way that the information from this study could be could be grouped or, or categorized in the future. Uh, but you see that you know the, the Mississippi alluvial plain is is predominantly cultivated crops. We see the large urban areas of Atlanta, uh, Houston showing up in red, um, and you know, a lot of it, a lot of the basins still being in the, uh, are forested, right? So we've had a lot of land cover change historically from when cultivation was huge uh, in the turn of the century to where we've had second growth forests and now we're moving to, you know, to urbanization and suburban development and increased agriculture. And so taking all of those characteristics of the basin into consideration, uh, the simulation tools that we move forward with. Uh, so a big part of what allowed us to complete a study of this, you know, spatial scale as well as all the inputs uh, is the USGS National Hydrologic Model uh, had been developed over the last several years, and this looked to bring together a consistent spatial framework of modeling units that we could then apply different modeling structures, and it would be a consistent way to look at each of those models as well as to integrate their their inputs and outputs to have that multi-model synthesis. So currently you know, this this geospatial fabric, uh, so the, the polygons are what we call hydrologic response units and they're connected with a stream network. Uh, so for the for the country this is about a hundred and hundred and ten thousand um, sorry 110,000 spatial units and about 50,000 stream segments. Uh, currently, the this monthly water balance model, which is a water accounting model, is, is set up for the country and is, has been calibrated. Um, uh, Andy Bach had headed up the effort along with uh, folks at the National Research Program in USGS. Uh, the daily time step precipitation runoff modeling system has also been set up on this structure, and that was uh, primarily the model that we fed other information into to then get those daily time step outputs of stream flow and runoff uh, for the study area to compute the statistics of flow. Uh, statistical methods were also uh, applied using uh, ordinary Krieging. Uh, Will Farmer was uh, one that developed those, and so those were based off of uh, the Gages 2 data set, which had analyzed and, and broken long-term stream gauges that USGS has collected data at for reference or non-reference conditions. So those that were least impacted by anthropogenic effects uh, were used in the, the area to develop uh, some time series that we used in the model calibration. The geodata portal has also uh, been a real, has been a, a huge part in allowing us to apply climate information, whether it's historical based off of observations or well or if it's some of these downscaled uh, general circulation model products. And this interface allows us to upload a uh, GIS shapefile of our model units and then pick which data sets we want. And then that does the spatial overlay from a grid, the grids to actually our polygons and does the, the area weighted averages. And so that allows us a convenient way to get the climatological inputs to the models. And then I will, I will talk, this is my one plug about calibration and parameter transfer. So uh, is this box here and that, and bringing all these various modeling platforms together along with observed data, remotely sensed information of, of evapotranspiration or snow accumulation, snow water equivalent, uh, we're able to uh, develop these models. So the modeling units for the actual study area so out of you know, so 20,000, just over 20,000 hydrologic response units. So just about a fifth of the of the units for the entire country, uh, almost 11,000 stream segments. And so the information that we show here today 
are available for each of these 20,000 polygons on the left and also you know, for these 10,700 stream segments on the right. Uh, so as, as we talk about various statistics or, or just outputs from, from the modeling simulations. Another part that we look to incorporate, because the historical was simulated from 1952 to current, and then the future was simulated uh, through 2099, but we, we summarized, we, for, for the GCPO, the planning window was 2060, the year 2060, and so for the future we, we computed the information from the 2045 to 2075 window. And so this data set that was developed by uh, Terry Soule and others uh, at the Aero Center, the USGS Aero Center, is an annual land cover change product from 1938 to 2100. And so we were able to look at changes in urban categories as well as uh, dominant land cover through time. So you see from 1950 to 2005 to 2060, uh, you see perhaps you know the agriculture becoming more intense in that Mississippi alluvial plain. You see perhaps hay and pasture land in this northwestern part of the study area starting to expand. And then of course you see the urban areas in red expanding through time as well. So the, it, all the effects that these uh, land cover changes would have on hydrology were incorporated. Then from, from the climate side, uh, so there's the, the, the latest round of, of downscaled general circulation models that were available through that geodata portal uh, were from the, the coupled model intercomparison project uh, version 5. And so we use the current set of, there's a current set of 13 models. So there, there are more total models available, but these were the 13 that were available on the, on the geodata portal. And then there are four, so they each have a historical period and then they each have four of these future scenarios, which are uh, called representative concentration pathways. And so they look at what could potentially the radiative forcings be, you know, that would affect temperature and precipitation into the future. Uh, and so each of these four were run uh, through, the, through the calibrated models. We'll focus on this red, uh, the RCP 8.5 for the results that I show here today. And it's interesting that you know for the 2060 planning year, if we come up here, it's that the the, the 6.0 and the 4.5 actually uh, tend to cross right about that time. So, but but we'll focus on the 8.5 for the results today. So there was a total of 13 future simulations, uh, 13 models with a total of 45 simulations. When you get those models with the available RCPs along with the historical observed information. So looking at some of the results, so this is for the historical period using the observed climate information. So this is, is runoff yield. And so this looks at how much runoff is coming off of those spatial units, but it's normalized to the drainage area of each. So it's, it's cubic feet per second per square mile is how we think of that. And that's a way to really get at, because that way if we don't show that just the bigger response units have more flow. It's a way to even it out. And we see that in general, if we remember the precipitation was much lower on this western fringe and much higher in this lower Appalachians region. That's what some of what's being reflected here. And then some of the scatter is also due to other attributes of, of the basin. So whether it's slope where you'll get more runoff per unit of precipitation on a steeper slope watershed than a flatter one. Um, and so this really points out to, to the, the variability and, and that if you have a local application, that, you know, this perhaps can provide information uh, at that scale for, for your efforts. And so aggregating those runoff values that we, we had in the last slide to the stream network, and so that's the distinction I'm making about runoff from the HRUs as opposed to stream flow that's in the stream network. And so here this, is the aggregation of stream flow across the study area. And so this makes the, the larger river stand out. Uh, now, this only considers the flow within the study area. Uh, and so, so for the Mississippi, this is aggregating, you know, just within here, it's not considering anything that is, that is north of about St. Louis. 
Uh, but you see that you know the the ACT and the ACF basin in the southeastern U.S. Uh, standing out in the Tennessee. So this gives your aggregations. You know, so some of these segments have an average of less than 10 cubic feet per second, and the Mississippi is up around I think 183,000 cubic feet per second is the the value in here. When we look at the changes to the model inputs, so there were there were two primary things that we looked at in the, the daily time step PRMS model. Um, so the, the dominant cover type, which is uh, categorized into four classes. Um, and so for the, the 1950 time slice, the 2005 and the 2060, we see, you know, mostly tree dominated, but as you move forward, you're starting to move towards more uh, to less Less tree and more uh, grass, which is what uh, an agricultural area would, would be classified as. And then also seeing these, these bare areas, which we represent the urban centers as they grow up. Now this last one, this, this uh, figure D corresponds to this explanation. What this looks at is, is these categories are, uh, in the model, they're categorized as a 0, 1, 2, or 3. And so this looks at the difference between the 2060 and the 2005. So uh, a negative value indicates that you're going from perhaps a, uh, a higher vegetative state to a, a lower vegetative state. So, so a negative three would be going all the way from, from trees to bear, or uh, a two may be trees to grass. And so looking at just the change, we see that much of the area is staying the same. But we are getting some that are, are going perhaps from a three to a two or a two to a zero. And then also in the urban areas, seeing that they're you know, having uh, these changes. And so you tend to see this donut around the, the area that was already urban. And then looking at the impervious area that kind of corresponds to those changes in cover type. Again, for the, the 1950, 2005, and 2060, we see uh, red indicating uh, higher impervious areas, and of course we see the urban areas, you know, of, of St. Louis or Atlanta or Houston or other areas uh, growing out over over these these years. And then again, this one looks at the difference between the, the current and the future, and so we see what these these suburban areas expanding uh, around these existing urban areas. Then when we look at uh, potential changes in Air temperature, so we'll look at the, the climate forcings and, and how that, that future time period may be different from the historical period and the effects on the hydrologic response. So these are broken up by season, uh, so the January to March, April to June, July to September on the bottom left, and then October to December on the bottom right. And so as we go to the more red colors, that means there's a, a larger difference in the average historical temperature and the, and the potential future temperature. So we're seeing here that uh, per, perhaps the summers are getting more hot than the winters are, right? So, so where winters are, you know, three to, to six or seven degrees Fahrenheit, that the summers in a lot of areas could be above that. Um, and so the implications that that may have on evapotranspiration or other processes. And then when we look at minimum air temperature, it's about the same pattern, but maybe not as as large of an increase. So that that may be hinting that the the diurnal chain, you know, difference between maximum daily and minimum daily, may be expanding a little bit, um, maybe up to up to a degree Fahrenheit. Um, then looking at percent potential change in precipitation by season, um, we see that. You know, some areas are getting drier, or and some areas are getting wetter, and so that that tends to be what we have found, even when we look across the GCMs, is that even for a given scenario in a given place, when you look across the models, you may have some that say it's going to get wetter, some that say it's going to get drier, and you may end up when you when you throw these together somewhere in the, you know, close to existing uh, volumes, but even though the total annual volume may not look different, if it's you know, how these seasonal distributions play out may be critical for certain ecological responses or, or water availability issues. 
And so when we when we put all those things through the models and look at all the different iterations and look at potential future change and runoff across the basin, you know, we see certain places, especially in the, the urbanizing areas, where without considering management options such as, you know, what was additional detention storage, will that be constructed as these areas are developed? That, you know, you could have large increases in, in runoff from those particular areas. But then in other areas, you know, where there's not a lot of urbanization, you're, you're seeing perhaps a substantial decreases in, in runoff across the landscape. And so, again, a very localized response based on how they see land cover changing, how they see uh, the, emission, the uh, representative concentration pathways playing out. And so, uh, you know, follow-on analyses from, you know, geared towards management could determine, you know, all right, so, so Georgia will handle urban, you know, urban development this way. They, they say that you need to capture at least this much volume, whereas Alabama, Mississippi, or somewhere else may have different criteria. And so those could be applied to these types of simulations to then perhaps have a, a better idea of how those uh, flows could be managed. So from the streamflow statistics, there were 52 statistics that we that we computed um, out of those five categories. So these numbers are, are just the number within each category. So there were 20 statistics associated with magnitude. Um, unfortunately, this table is is alphabetical, but Generally, everything that begins with an M is, is a magnitude statistic. Uh, and some of these were standard statistics that you could use existing software, and some of these seasonal ones we had to actually uh, code up it along the same lines that these others were coded. Uh, and we looked at this evaluation of how these things could be, you know, the construed into the future. So it's, you know, when when we see that there's a change in the hydrologic response and we see a change in these statistics, is it something that we were able to match in the historical record? So do our, our baseline simulations using observed climate data, are the, the general circulation model based simulations able to even match that simulated condition? And so when we run the statistical analysis on the distribution of these statistics in the future, in the historical period, each of these that have an X met the condition that 75% that of the modeling units were able to, to pass that and say that both the observed-based simulations and the GCM-based simulations were part of the same distribution. Uh, but we do see there are large chunks of area, you know, of these statistics that, that didn't have that X. And so there may be a, a lower confidence level that you're able to, to say something about those into the future or perhaps you know, there, there are certain ones that you just aren't able to say something meaningful about in the future. And so we've had a couple papers, one that was published in 2013 by Lauren Hay um, that looked at this type of analysis in the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint Basin. And there's also one currently um, in review that Andy Bach had, had, uh, had authored uh, looking at that same type of analysis for the country. And so when we start to see how much we can say about the future, based on how things are, you know, have behaved in the past, at least based on modeling structures or data set structures. Uh, this may give you, uh, provide some information about the confidence you can have in certain estimates. So kind of to bring this to the, uh, to the scale of information that ecologists may use or, or folks that are, are biologists, when you start to say, all right, we have all this flow information and we have all these statistics computed, and that's great, but, you know, is it going to be able to help me make a decision or to evaluate the effects on particular species? Uh, so when we look at a, the statistic that looks at when, what day of the year does the spring maximum flow occur, you know, on average, and then this looks at how that is projected to change potentially in the future based on the historical timing, that we see some stream segments that it's going to happen earlier, um, and then other segments that could happen, you know, up to almost two weeks later, and one is, you know, up to maybe a week earlier on average. 
And so when uh, this example was, was taken out of the, the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC uh, report that looked at these hypotheses of potential response, uh, so this is for alligator gar based on the timing of overbank flow. And so when they look at this baseline condition, they say, all right, well, we think that it could vary some and there wouldn't be too much impact to their spawning, but then if you go too early or you go too late in the season, then you're going to start affecting their spawning success. And so tying these hydrologic information to then to those curves that where you perhaps are able to quantify this this range is what we hope these information can can tie into in that respect. And so from another angle, looking at you know the spring spring flows again uh, and how they're project you know could potentially change into the future. And we see that the the yellow segments are plus or minus 10 percent of the historical. Uh, those that are greener, mostly around the urban areas, you know there may be some increases in the spring flow. But but generally across the basin, it, it looks like there will be uh, less water available in that, that spring season across the stream segments. And so all of that information that comes out of the, the, the precipitation runoff modeling system simulations and then the statistics that are computed are all will be available through ScienceBase. Uh, so we, we provide data releases now that accompany our reports so that all of the, you know, the GIS files of the model units along with the inputs and outputs to the models as well as the statistics that we've computed will all be available for folks to, to grab uh, from ScienceBase. And then for some of the information by tying that information to the GIS files and then setting them up a certain way will actually will, would actually be able to link to those information uh, through the GCPO LCC Conservation Planning Atlas. Um, and so that would may for maybe for certain things that we know or that, that folks say everybody would need, uh, perhaps we could put those up for certain information that is lower priority. Maybe you're just able to get the data sets and then proceed with your analysis off of the science based page. So the water balance model uh, had been completed first and, and the water balance model along with being developed for the study area was able was developed for the country. And so there actually is an interactive web portal to obtain that information. And so it's at this, this link up in the right hand corner here. And so this is the, uh, the front page of that uh, web portal. Uh, and so the information that's contained there, there's, there's even more uh, scenarios that were run for the water balance model. There was more information available at a monthly time step through the geodata portal than there were the daily. And so there were, you know, the, the the version three of the coupled model into comparison project, and then the current version five that we used for the, the daily simulation. So you have this entire pick list uh, to obtain information from those simulations. And so when you look at an aggregation based on future windows of time, seasonal outputs, and then looking at the range across the general circulation models you know, for temperature, precipitation, runoff, you know, it's just a, a huge amount of information available at the monthly time step through this, this, uh, through this portal that, that folks could use as a starting point, perhaps based on your research question, based on your management question, you say, well, maybe I only need monthly, maybe I don't need daily or the statistics. And so there's other options that are less data intensive. So just to give you an example of running through the through that portal, um, you know, so you would go, you're able to, to zoom in to pick your, your modeling unit of interest or a stream gauge of interest that would aggregate the area above it. Then you're able to pull up this plot uh, window to where you can specify what unit you want. Uh, and after you select that unit on the page, you can say, all right, I want this variable. So there's seven different uh, six or seven different outputs for uh, for the water balance portal and then you're able to say okay I want you know if I'm looking at potential changes into the future here's my historical period here's my future that's you know if you do a running mean and then you pick 
which model scenarios you want. So you can pick them all or you can just pick certain ones. And then you can output this. So this is just an example plot based on the criteria that I set for this example. Uh, looking at departures of stream flow from the historical for the 8.5 RCP scenario. Now there's, uh, you see there's five different tabs. So there's uh, five different types of, of plots that could be output. And there's also this button in each of the windows that you can actually download the modeling results that were used to generate your figure. So if you want to make your own figures, you want to do additional analyses, you can get the raw inputs to, to then do what you like. And so some of the other output, you know, standard plotting, you know, looking at mean monthlies of the historical is this red bar, and then you see changes through, you know, 2030, 2060, 2090, and uh, what they see as the potential changes across the the area of interest, and then looking at those seasonally as well. And then also, much like the PRMS, this this page is live. Um, so this has actually been, you know, has, has been finalized and published. So that in science base, you can access this information as well for the monthly water balance model outputs. All right, so just to run you through a, a, a case study of instead of looking study area wide, looking at a particular basin, and so. Some of the work we've done in the past uh, in the ACF basin, uh, Potato Creek specifically, is a, a tributary in the lower uh, Piedmont, so it's about almost just under 200 square miles, and uh, we've worked with uh, with uh, USGS ecologists in the past about linking these models. So when we look at what, what's the dynamic land cover just for this basin, it's not real exciting. Everything is predominantly staying. Uh, in the tree category from historical to future. When we look at changes of impervious area, we see that from the historical, not a whole lot, but uh, uh, there's the city of Thomaston here in the lower part of the basin, so there's some urbanization, and then we see some growth. This is the metro Atlanta area, uh, just north of the basin, so we see perhaps some of the suburbs spreading into the headwaters. And then we see here that you know the historical mean monthly stream flow. So typical of the southeastern stream that we you know wetter in the winter time when it's uh, when evapotranspiration is energy limited and, and drier in the summertime when we're uh, more water limited and about an average of uh, 190 cfs cubic feet per second coming out of that that tributary. And when we look at changes in air temperature seasonally. Uh, more less increase in the winter time than the other seasons uh, and then for, for minimum air temperature the same story similar to what we saw at the uh, at the, the study area scale and then when we look at precipitation we see that the summers perhaps are getting going to have an increase in, in precipitation accumulation where um, the spring and the fall seasons are right about no change uh, and so then we look at the impacts of that on, on hydrologic response and that for each of these stream segments we see that perhaps either there's no not a, an appreciable change you know within 10 percent or perhaps there's a drying in the winter time or uh, wetter conditions in, in the spring and fall so all of these things playing together to what is the question that you want to answer and, and providing a space you know the information at a resolution that is actually able to be to be used and then looking at some of those statistics again, uh, just for this basin. So this was a study that was published uh, by Mary Freeman and others that looked at uh, the impacts of water withdrawals on uh, species richness or uh, species occupancy. And that we see, you know, with increasing water withdrawals, there was potentially uh, degradation of, of those uh, metrics. And so when we think instead of water withdrawals, we perhaps look at effects of climate or land use change, you know, having the effects of increasing flow or decreasing flow. Again, this is that, that spring peak statistic that we looked at at the basin. And so we see here that the headwaters perhaps start, you know, are, are on average getting that peak flow later um, than, than we had seen historically. And so how does that play in? And in the southeast, it's definitely not as cut and dry as it would be, say, 
uh, or as consistent as it would be in a snowmelt dominated basin where you perhaps have a really narrow, relatively narrow window of where you expect the peak, but in the southeast, because we're primarily rain driven, you know, there, there may be some scattering, more scatter in those, in those uh, days. And then again, looking at the spring, at least for this basin, you know, the spring volumes are looking to be about, you know, the average can, of the GCMs look to be about within the, the 10 percent window. Um, and then one more statistic, so looking at this rise rate, uh, this RA3 statistic that looks at the rise rate of the hydrographs so on the days that we have storm flow, how fast are these, uh, how fast are they rising and how fast would we expect those to perhaps change into the future. So this is the percent difference in the rise rate. So this, this headwater reach because it's, you know, maybe getting crept in on by the suburbs of the metro area, potentially increasing 25 to 50 percent. So to, to wrap things up, all of that information that, you know, that we're providing um, as a part of this study, so we have the, we have the water balance model simulations for historical and future, and we're able to look at the, the figures through the water balance portal or you could obtain that information at a monthly time step uh, for your specific area of interest. For the precipitation runoff modeling system, uh, again historical future simulations also including dynamic land cover uh, from <clears throat> for, the, for the, the cover type and the impervious area parameters. Uh, the statistics that were computed off of the PRMS simulations, so there's 52 statistics for each of those modeling units. Uh, so when you start to, to multiply these out, there's just a, a huge amount of information. And so we really hope that, you know, that some of these things will be able to fit into the, the needs of quantifying both meeting the targets of the GCPO, but also stakeholders <clears throat> and managers that have their own efforts ongoing. And so for the for the hosting of the information, again, there's there's the water balance model portal that we had went through briefly. All of the information from all of the simulations that were shown today will be available on ScienceBase. So you could just download the raw inputs or uh, the spatial information. And then also that uh, certain outputs would be linked in the correct format that they could be viewed through the conservation planning atlas. Again, uh, all this, you know, these models, the water balance model has been uh, documented. Uh, the, the daily time steps are moving through review. And so there'll be a the final report as well as a, a potential fact sheet that we could uh, talk about the content of. And so just briefly, you know, there's a whole list of collaborators that uh, we're thankful for in, in providing, you know, whether it's in-kind funds or, or collaborating as we move through this research. And uh, with that, I will see if there are any questions. I think we've got about 15 minutes, so thank you. Thanks very much, Jacob. Um, you have your first question from Todd, and I would recommend anybody else that has a question, please go ahead and start writing them in the question pane. And Todd, I will unmute you. You're here. Are you there? Todd? Are you there, Todd? There we go. Okay. <laughs> I'm unmuted now. Uh, so, Jacob, thanks very much for this presentation. Uh, I have a question about the the uh, the confidence to use uh, some of these variables projected into the future. You had that table of the 13 GCMs and the 52 metrics. Uh, quick count: I counted nine of those metrics that had an X for all 13 GCMs, uh, but there were a number that had 10, 11, 12. Do you, could you give us some guidance on where you think a good cutoff is for what's usable? So I, I think that, uh, yeah, along those lines, uh, depending on, and, and that's something that we, we also look to perhaps some of the, the climate scientists on. And so, you know, I, I see out of the 13, you know, if we if we draw a line at if if the majority of of those GCMs, you know, can match the observed base simulations. Um, now there's a kind of a, a follow-on analysis that, based off of that table that you referenced, 
that we looked to compute the statistics using only those GCMs that were able to pass that test. And so from that perspective, when we're, when we're talking about, you know, computing per, perhaps percentiles across the basin, then, you know, we at least want, you know, we'd at least want half of them to, to pass that test. Now, the, for those to get an X also, it, it you know, required 75% of the model units to pass the test. And so it's not that the whole study area passed. And so you could drill down. So for a particular model, you know, study area, sub area within this, the GCPO, you could see for your particular HRUs or, or aggregated watershed, you know, were there more or less that of GC, the GCMs and the statistics that fit your criteria. So that's kind of, this is kind of a broader way to slice through it, but it may be that for your particular area, things may be better or, or, or worse from an uncertainty perspective. Um, but really it's, you know, based on things that, that the analyses we've done, um, I don't have a hard and fast rule about, you know, because we ran 13 and there's really, you know, perhaps there's 20 available and we didn't run those as well. Perhaps there's some others that fit or, or don't fit. But I, but I would recommend that you, you would perhaps look at the local results of the information that we, that we provide um, from science base to then say something more about your particular area. Yeah, thanks. That's helpful. Sure. Okay, and we have another question from Greg. So I'm going to tr find you in the list here. All right, you want to go ahead and ask your question, Greg? Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, yeah, really interesting presentation, Jacob. Appreciate you uh, doing that for us. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions we've had in the GCPO that I've asked before, uh, don't know that I've ever uh, gotten an answer that, that satisfied me yet, but anyway, we have a flood in inundation frequency data layer that's based on historic uh, uh, flooding in the GCPO. It's really been a valuable uh, data layer, I think, for a lot of our partners. We see a lot of use out of that. And the question is, is can we use this modeling and this future outlooks to sort of predict what the frequency of flooding might look like in the GCPO in certain watersheds or water or river basins or things like that. So that's, that's basically the question. Typically with these GCM based simulations, it really depends on the time scale that you need the information at. And that if you need, if you're looking for, for daily flooding information, then that's probably going to be, really uncertain if you're looking for perhaps you know weekly seven day high flows to kind of use as a surrogate for when you would have the most inundation then that may be better you know and so it it's that i think the the confidence increases as the time step increases that you look at that information because uh, i know there's been certain activities even with like federal highways and stuff where everybody's trying to incorporate you know what are the changes per, perhaps in, in these flood frequencies? You know, what's, what's perhaps the new 1% flood or the new 500, you know, the, the, the 100 year flood or the 500 year flood? And, and I think with these, with these tools and the data sets, and, and it's, it's that the, uh, you know, the precipitation from, from GCM to GCM can, can have quite a different uh, distribution based on, even for the same RCP scenario. And, and so, Again, it, 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 I guess it depends on what, again, what time, time step you, you can live with to make your decisions. Is it, is it daily that you're looking for, or is it something that could be a little longer? Well, I think it would definitely be longer, a longer period, maybe perhaps even, um, you know, seasonally or something like that, you know, two or three month period, I don't know. Um, and <laughs> Yvonne Allen would be a better one to answer that kind of question. In terms of what the use would be, but uh, just just trying to think about, you know, what, from what I took away from your presentation was, it looked like at least in the southern part of the GCPO that runoff would be less, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons there at certain times of the year, and and I think that would be a, 
I think for some of our managers, um, that would be of some concern about, you know, uh, about what that's going to look like and how those, how those are going to manifest themselves across the landscape in terms of their management abilities. So just wanting to uh, try to see if we can use this information uh, to, to give some projections out to our land managers, kind of what they might expect as from river flows, flow simulations, things like that. Yep, so I think, yeah, looking monthly to seasonally, looking at a, an, an average over that 30 year, you know, so when we talk about 2060, we, we're, our results are based off the 2045 to 2075 window, because when you start looking at climatological periods, you want, you know, 30 years. Um, so, so looking at, yeah, the average and perhaps the distribution, I think that, I think that this may, may help inform some of that. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I don't see any more questions. Anybody else want to raise their hand and we could just call on you informally? Well, if not, I think you've uh, covered this very well and I don't know whether you wanted, um, I, I can stop the recording now, which I'm going to do. Thank you very much everyone for attending.